Samantha and Skylar, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So this conversation, we're going to talk about feminine wisdom. And in particular, I'm really interested in this conversation because over the time Rebel Wisdom has been going, a lot of people have made the comment, obvious, well, very, very true, that the ten people that we've tended to interview have skewed heavily male. And there's a lot of truth in that. When people make that observation, I usually say, well, please suggest some, some women voices and would love to kind of make it more balanced. And often the same voices come up. Um, there's a very small number of women in this space at the moment. There's something that I feel about the way that the kind of galaxy brain tendency tends to skew male, particularly this kind of very systematizing intelligence, which you can talk about a little bit, which seems to map on to kind of theories of the extreme male brain. And it makes me wonder what the, what the conversation is missing. Mm. And I've invited you both because you're both very powerful, um, interesting, intelligent, tuned in voices who've been tracking this conversation as well. Um, so I'd love if you could begin maybe by introducing yourselves and uh, telling us your, a bit about your background. Sure. Maybe you first, Samantha? Sure. I'm Samantha Sweetwater, and I am, I've been facilitating transformation with adults for over 30 years. And uh, my background is in dance and embodiment somatics yoga and permaculture and systems frameworks and coaching and psychedelic plant medicine. And um, I founded and directed Dancing Freedom, which was a global community and movement for embodiment, and Peace Body Japan, which specifically translated that to Japanese culture. And now I run a small psychedelic ministry called One Life Circle. Um, my passion is around culture creation and community-based embodied pro-relational models that help us to make sense of ourselves and our shared world in a sacred way together. So I'm Skylar Brown and uh, I'd say I'm a poet, a healer, um, facilitator of group experience. Um, I had a career in advertising and so communication is a big piece of um, my training, my background, it is a passion of mine and also cultural, um, just like cultural embodiment, cultural awareness. I was, I was a futurist and trend spotter. So my job for 15 years was to take in and translate the culture, but for commercial purposes, like, you know, to sell more merchandise, to build brands. Um, I had a spiritual crisis and jumped out of that world and, uh, and the last 15 years have been, um, a healing journey, um, for myself that, um, has, uh, included a lot of trauma work. Um, I've studied with Thomas Hubel for years and, um, I work with people individually and with groups on trauma healing. So personal and collective trauma healing, um, and then also embodiment, and they kind of go hand in hand. So I'm always curious about what it is that's in the way of us being in our bodies and in right relationship with each other, with the earth, um, with what's happening. Uh, I have a tantric uh, Buddhist orientation, and so um, I'm also, you know, really in every moment, whether I'm at a conference, in a meeting, <laughs> facilitating a session, teaching a class, or even just with friends, um, I'm very interested in what is actually happening. And um, uh, being in as intimate a, a relationship with reality as it's happening as is possible. And then, as I said, what's interesting to me is what stands in the way of that. Um, I have a company called Art of Emergence, and um, so when I founded that a couple of years ago, it was to bring, in part, to bring the feminine into the corporate world, and I was working with a lot of corporate leaders, 
at a certain point, I realized that uh, it was a losing proposition. I was, I think we have a different view on this. Maybe we could talk about it. Um, I began to feel that it was incompatible, the corporate world and the economic system that we're in, capitalism, and it resists, it actively resists feminine principles. And so um, I stopped banging my head against the wall on that one and, um, and let my client base sort of like filter out and my last corporate client we finished our work um, about six months ago and um, and now I find I'm working with a lot of young people who are ready to jump out of the system and not sure what the landing uh, space is you know I mean maybe they're in a spiritual awakening process um, they're definitely feeling the systems change and the, the shifts. They're wanting to be living differently and working differently. And so helping them navigate some of that is, is where the work seems to be in this moment. Um, and I guess I could mention the cultural embodiment piece. Yeah. Yeah, there's a project that's coming through right now. Um, and sometimes I feel as an artist, like the way work comes through me is that it's like projects, like something will arise and I like pour myself completely into that and, Cultural embodiment is that piece right now, and it's a, um, for me, it's a contribution to the sense-making landscape, and the format is uh, basically that we take a piece of the culture, so something that's trending, something that seems to be contributing to the culture wars, or just seems hot that week, um, or in that moment, and as a group, um, tune in, so find a state of presence, become embodied, take in the media, and then uh, collectively digest and process and share about our embodied and our felt sense and the emotional experience um, that's evoked by the piece without um, going into judgment, beliefs, um, opinions of the mind. And so it's becoming, it's more of a healing process than I understood when I began it. Um, and it's one of those beautiful projects that's revealing itself as as I commit to it and as I put my energy into it, it's teaching me. Um, and it's brought a lot of people back into relationship with the media is some of the feedback I get is that a lot of people who were disenchanted and turned away and feeling like I can't handle this on my own. It's very hard to process the world's pain on your own to do it in a group setting and where there's a, a understanding and an unconditional space of just acceptance of whatever it is you're feeling we can explore the complexity and the, the strangeness of what the media evokes in us mm. um and it's really healing and enlightening mm. yeah i was going to mention that the cultural embodiment piece that you're doing at the stoa mm -hmm. which i think is a really good practical example of what i would consider like a feminine mm -hmm. principle so it's it's about sense making but it's bringing in the felt sense. It's bringing in the kind of visceral response. And it's it's something, the word sense making is interesting because I think some people use it from a purely like propositional level. And that to me feels very sort of disembodied and quite male, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, whereas this, for, for me, and I think for us at Rebel Wisdom, it's always been, can you bring in the other felt senses? Can you bring in the embodiment piece? Because if you're not, you're yeah you're you're missing out on a on a whole it's there anyway yeah i mean that was the thing that it was like you know we always where we often create what we need mm -hmm. i was needing this because that's the way that information lands in me it's a, a very embodied experience it's a very sensual mm -hmm. experience a very emotional experience and so i mean you know having friends in the sense making space i was feeling very frustrated mm -hmm. um i was i was watching and I put it that way because that was the experience it was like standing on the outside of what was happening and watching the sense being made mm. in this conceptual kind of abstracted conceptual space but I was hurting or I was scared or mm. I was uh confused you know like like all of these factors like all of these experiences these internal experiences are um that was a huge part of my sense making. It is my sense making of the world, and so uh, when it occurred to me that there might be others, 
<laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. what if I invited other people to do this with me? Mm-hmm. And um, and it was just really, it's been very beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I loved when we talked prior to meeting here mm-hmm. about that because it, the frame of cultural embodiment actually helped me make sense of a, process, a couple of different processes that I also do mm-hmm. in slightly different ways. And I, I, I think we what's interesting about the sense making space is the sense making space is largely held in a broadcast format Mm. and a broadcast format is just by default. Here's the person speaking who has the authority and then process happens somewhere else and to hold spaces that are a space of cultural embodiment. uh, In my ceremonies, I sometimes do a council round where often we put something that's collectively relevant. It might be collectively personally relevant, like someone died who we all really love or someone is dying or there's a family that needs support. Um, it can also be something that's collectively relevant, like the elephant in the room of existential risk, that mm. that is a typical topic, um, or the elephant in the room of uh, attention uh, mining and how do we actually become sovereign in our attention. Mm. Um, that's another interesting topic. I do the same thing when I gather community and I've always called it council. Mm. And to me, another dimension that is also the feminine is in my sensing, I feel like that collective process is implicitly sacred. Mm. Mm. That sacred is something I think is also often missing from the conversation. And there's a lot of kind of cringing from it or historical contextualizing of how someone views themselves relative to God or the sacred but I also think it's something that's actually implicit in um, fabrics of connectivity that are rich. Mm. And I don't know if you would feel the same way. That's something I feel is really true. Mm. And then there's, I like connecting those dots of like, there's, there's the being who in a sense is functioning on a broadcast level, like a guru. Mm. Um, Or an epistemic authority. As an, exactly. As an epistemic authority. And then there's, there's a process that actually makes that meaningful, applicable, translatable, usable, um, and also just integratable that is so fundamental. Do you think that epistemic authority role also, or that broadcast role also skews as a, as a male way of showing up rather than a female way of showing up? I have to insert this because I, you know, this term public thinker, mm. oh, I, yeah. I a public intellectual, Mm -hmm. so I began to call myself a public feeler, Mm. because it actually really, Mm. really describes the strange role that I often play of being like I I process very outwardly, Mm. and sometimes I think I'm processing for a lot of others, (laughs) people who are not processing, and a lot of my work these days, whether it's cultural embodiment or this. Um, art of embodied conversation I'm doing with a friend, David Sauvage, where we publicly get into a very subtle, very intimate state and then heal um, with an audience. <laughs> it's like, I'm a public feeler. So um, that doesn't quite answer your question, but I think it's like, I, I just want to put on the table another job description um, that there there's another um, set of skills. There are these competencies that we're, I think this world of, uh, like rebel wisdom is doing the embodiment and flow course right now. Mm. Like it feels like it's on the radar. And there was, for those of us who are facilitators in that session, one of the things we all recognized was a great sense of relief that we'd finally been invited to the table, that we were finally, um, together. Like a lot of us have been practicing a little bit in isolation Mm. or felt like we were like, hello, there's a whole nother way of experiencing reality over here. Mm. Um, but I think seeing it as a competency and something that can be modeled, taught, um, admired, even, I'm going to go there, like with the galaxy brain, like when I, I admire it, it's so incredible what some of these thinkers can do with their minds. Like I'm learning and I'm admiring what's happening and I feel that what women like people, but women like Samantha and myself have to offer is also equally admirable. And we've worked really hard to be embodied and to bring through these wisdom principles, especially in a world that doesn't always recognize them or where they're not visible. 
Um, but yeah, so yeah, I put it out. I think, I think it's becoming recognized, but, um, as a different set of skills. Mm -hmm. I do think, I mean, I think it skews heavily male. I think it skews heavily masculine and that Mm -hmm. there's, there's Mm -hmm. an interesting distinction there. I like to work with a Jungian frame very much in terms of the masculine and feminine. So on the one side, there is the masculine and the, the quadrant we most often organize and have organized our civilization around is the active masculine, the mm. structural masculine. And then above that in um, the quiescent or the still would be like the archetype of, this would be the archetype of Yang. Mm. And then up here we have the archetype of Shiva and presence and witness, which even in sense-making communities and in a culturally dominant way, we have um, emphasized masculine oriented views of spirituality that Mm. orient towards presence, that orient towards stillness, that orient towards like the kind of singularity of enlightened consciousness. That's a masculine Mm. principle. And then on the feminine side, we have like the active feminine of birthing and art making and Shakti. And, you know, in that quadrant, we would, our practices would look more like dancing or Mm. making art Mm. or Mm. lovemaking to, to, or, or, some kind of collective non-linear movement sense-making process. And then above that, we have um, yin and the assimilative process. And that's where grieving occurs. It's where deep felt experiences happen. So like a cultural embodiment mm-hmm. experience to me is, is orients a little bit more towards the yin space, which is, a, is where integration happens. Mm, I love that. I think that's true. That's the space in the healing that happens mm-hmm. in that like mm-hmm. that yin space of holding, yeah, or in or of listening to someone yeah, else, listening. and exactly. um, but in a felt sense, listening and feeling. Um, and I think I think what's mm-hmm. you know what's missing in in a sense often is like we have this masculine structural which is very left brain friendly. Mm-hmm. It's structurally friendly. It's outcome friendly. Um, and it does tend to railroad those other things if it doesn't then recognize them as equally valuable. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, you know, I think it's interesting because I find that kind of one of the sweet things about galaxy brain people, is they're actually very good often at those other quadrants when invited. Mm-hmm. And I get curious about that in the space as like a transformational principle is, is, is how do we put the map out. Here's the map of all of the ways Mm -hmm. in which we experience and know and integrate, and then start to cultivate that even as a conversation with our galaxy brain friends. And I think we're in a culture that's very unbalanced, particularly in the public space. I'd love to ask you a little bit about that because I've always been really interested in men's work um, and and the the positive, the healthy masculine, which it doesn't feel there's much of a place for in the culture at the moment. Mm -hmm. Like masculine, and the shift that I would love to see is because it feels in the media at the moment that the the perspective is masculinity is toxic, we need less of it. Whereas my sense is immature masculinity is toxic and we need more mature masculinity, Mm -hmm. and immature femininity is toxic and we need more mature femininity. Mm -hmm. And that would be a hell of a development of the conversation. I feel like those of us who are in the kind of the world of personal growth and are looking at ourselves kind of this seems pretty obvious to us because we're aware of our own shadows we're aware of the shadows in the culture but that feels to me like a really yeah. a really important conversation that i feel is starting to shift my my, my spidey sense as a, as a as a journalist is we're far enough after me too now that i think we're able to 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 pro to, to move forward on that conversation me too was a necessary step and the 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 feeling after me too is men now is your time to listen women now is your time to speak it's like that made sense but by definition that's not a healthy relationship going forward like both have to be able to speak both have to be able to have um yeah it's it by definition not a not a relationship i'd love yeah your thoughts on that Mm -hmm. from the cultural level what does a healthier conversation look like Mm. i mean one of the things it's it's when you said the immature versus the mature, I I also see it as the distorted 
-hmm. It's like the wounds. I mean, it's not only just a matter of maturing, Mm -hmm. um, though maybe maybe they're the same process, the healing. Um, And what happens for me when I look deeply at the relationality between men and women and the masculine and the feminine is um, that we are hurting each other Mm. all the time just all the time like it's very humbling um to actually open that dialogue and uh to own um and take responsibility for the pain that our wounds are causing each other and when we begin to see that then we can kind of we can repair we can begin the repair process and we can really have uh compassion for where we're at like where we're at it's um it's almost like like i have have actually taken this perspective i'd be curious if you've gotten this vision i've had this vision of being like airlifted off of earth and then looking back towards her and one of the strong messages that has come through is oh my god what you are doing to each other like the pain that you are causing inflicting like and I'm going to, again, I want to say men and women in this case, though, obviously it's much, uh, um, I want to be more inclusive in the way I hold the frame, but there is something about men and women, um, over time that we've really hurt each other and we continue to do it moment by moment by moment. And so the nuance, opening the conversation, a lot of humility is required. I agree with you. I think it's, there's a readiness for it. You feel that? I think it feels really good. It feels really good. Like it's time. Yeah. I think there is a readiness for it. I think there's like, there's a conversation that I, I feel would be helpful to ground in this four quadrant model about what is the masculine? What is the feminine? What is the distinction between the human incarnations of those qualities and the divine? I like, I think in kind of new age spiritual culture, there's a huge shadow of kind of women grasping after divine feminine and men grasping after divine masculine and that being coming a platform for developing super ego identities that have very little to do with actually embodying these competencies that and I think there's a conversation in that is a very much a human conversation about self responsibility about I mean I think I, I truly feel that that conversation begins and in some ways ends with self-responsibility. I I think I'm going to second that. I really, that's what feels most resonant to me is taking responsibility Mm -hmm. on a personal level. Yeah. Because, because anything else is, is a projection dialogue. Anything else is outsourcing the problem. And I think women do that all the time. Women do that all the time. They say like the problem with men is, or what the divine masculine really is, is, or what the divine feminine really is, is. And I very rarely hear anything there that, I mean, even a conversation that would sound like, I feel that I'm embodying the feminine in these ways. Mm. Do you witness that in me? Like that would be a useful conversation. But, um, and I think it also requires us taking responsibility for how we communicate on social media. Mm. I also think it requires, um, I don't consume much mainstream entertainment or media, but I also think it requires a certain rigor with how we are spoon fed sociopathy and narcissism and sexism and misogyny in media and something that like, there's an aspect of the conversation I've been curious lately about nurturing uh, people's movements mm. of um, boycotting things that don't that that nurture the wrong frames, that mm. nurture the wrong imprinting, and that's particularly been true around entertainment and media in relationship to toxic masculinity mm. and toxic identity dynamics. Mm. Yeah, there's also something about how the conversation seems driven by. You mentioned how we wounding it each other conversation seems to be driven by the wounded Mm -hmm. on both sides Mm -hmm. um i think on on, online particularly kind of like the 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 manosphere seems to be a lot of a lot of men who've been wounded in their relationships with women i think in a way the women who've been wounded by men have more of a megaphone because i think that's more dominant in the legacy media 
um, structures because it's more kind of socially accepted to see women as as, as only victims. Well, we just had the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't have to go there. Yeah. But that was the flashpoint. I think that's what was so electric about that cultural moment. Um, and of course, it's like a hall of mirrors. I mean, it must be said that our media scape at this moment is a hall of mirrors. You can get lost in it. It is fragmented. It is absolutely distorted and confusing. So nothing is clear in a sense. But what felt, what I was watching with interest was um, the jubilation and the relief that whether, I'm not saying anything about who was right or wrong, but the relief in the fact that the man was being heard in this kind of archetype, I don't even want to call it archetypal, what would you call mm. it, like, sadly very common experience of domestic mm. um, violence and, and discord. Um, mm. She accuses him, and he, he tells his story, and it's heard, and, um, I mean, in the end, she was villainized and there was all kinds of... Yeah. But I, I think it, it was, there was something healing or that relief. I felt a little bit of valve or maybe a shift or an opening yeah. in this, like, okay, maybe we need to listen to all parties. It complicated the narrative beyond what the, the yeah. media likes to yeah. portray yeah. it as. Right, right. And it's such a complex picture because... Um, yeah, the fact that it was a court case and a court case has a winner and a loser and it's immediately put into this frame of, I mean, what? how much more powerful would it have been if both had been able to own their own part in what was clearly an incredibly right. toxic relationship? And I, I read a couple of accounts of the trial. There was a, a statement from, I think, their therapist who said neither of them, they're basically in a mutually abusive relationship. Neither of yes. them have the ability to de escalate arguments right. like it was it was a right. yeah well i want to say that what happened when we did a, the trial mm. in cultural embodiment mm. was we watched some of the evidence we watched a video of them interacting mm. in their kitchen space mm. huh. and then what the group where we landed was i've been in that scene mm. i know that place mm. yeah I remember my parents arguing or uh, one guy saying, you know what? I've done what Johnny did in that video and worse. And all of a sudden, all of us were witnessing this very sad experience of the privacy. Like none of this should be, I mean, it's kind of like Tyson Yunkaporta's work. It's like, if there's going to be conflict in the community, bring it into the public space. Like let's stand around the couple and help them sort this out. It is so intense what we've done by isolating ourselves in these little households. And so the, in the cultural embodiment, there was so much empathy. There was like very quickly uh, a recognition that this is us. Mm. Like I've been in this scene. I've That's been in this movie. It's fascinating because what you've done is kind of the opposite of how I, I love that idea. It's sort of like the idea of that it takes a, a village to hold a marriage. Um, yes. And that's why the, the marriage ceremony is like everyone coming together and helping to support the married mm -hmm. couple because we can't see ourselves and we can't mm -hmm. see our patterns and we need that kind of reflection and we need that support to, to see when we're being the egotistical prick with the other person. And, <laughs> and like it's, 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 it's a really healthy dynamic and it's fascinating that Tyson's pointing to that. But in a way, and it sounds like there was a very healing moment with what you did on cultural embodiment, but in a way what happened with that trial was the absolute opposite. Because what happened was people taking small clips, kind of weaponizing every oh, yeah. single part of the yeah. trial, yeah. everyone tribalizing on one side or the other. Like there was no, it's the opposite of the, well, let's try and help each person Absolutely. see their, let's, know, let's, right? let's, let's look after each person, help them see their shadows. Like it's completely the opposite. So this is so important yeah. and I want to, I would love, why? Mm. It feels like, it's almost like um, there's a, is this like game a, game a, game it's B like a dynamics? Cultural. Yeah, and you could say it's a feminine cultural competency. Mm. Like where the, the game A dynamics is someone's got to win, someone's mm. got to lose. Let's make sure that happens and let's have a really good time and watching somebody die. You know, and like Isn't the that game. Feminine that's. 
That's super. We could say that I was saying it's game A. Mm. I won't. I don't have a need to say it's masculine, actually. Right. But I do have a need to say it's game A. But then the game B competency is a feminine competency. Right. And that's an interesting distinction where we don't need to call it masculine or feminine to just acknowledge that it's a pathology. Mm. But we can say the solution to the pathology is in a feminine quadrant of consciousness, which has to do with community being able to hold mm. charge. And that, I mean, it's funny, the, the, the distinction of feminine is breaking down a little bit for me there, but it, it, it's an embodied competency mm -hmm. that's, the incompetence, that's the competency of presence, like a whole bunch of sane it's people like co-regulating with other people. I'm seeing like the integration. It's like the sacred marriage in a sense in that way. Like maybe the game B is more like, because when you say presence, I suddenly see Shiva Shakti. I see, I see the both and um, all the quadrants. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel the body of community, like a body that's bigger than an individual. Mm -hmm. That, that does the way that to understand that would be in the quadrant of embodiment. Mm. But the way it functions is through many brains and bodies co-regulating with many, with each other mm. in a way that is compassionate and nurturing. And mm. But you know, this is like, I'm, I hate, I hate that this is coming up, but maybe it needs to be said. And I'm curious your experience of this because, um, you know, there's, I feel like we're in such a process of detoxification right now. Just like that is one of the, um, I don't know, characteristics or the qualities of what we're going through in this transitional, like time between worlds. Mm. Um, like <laughs> I want to purge, <laughs> even as I say it, and you know, even in, like in ceremony, there's like, there's a lot of purging happening at the moment. And I think we are detoxifying. And one of the things that is hard for me sometimes about the feminine like when you said that this is a feminine the community and this is a feminine modality yes and i find that um women still need to work through the game a dynamics the competitiveness the vying for position and place that often happens subterraneously. Yes, I was going to say it's very subtle. And I think that's part of our work in this time as women is to purify or detoxify um, our natural knowing and inclination towards relationship and community and holding space and holding each other. That has been by the, you know, like in the patriarchy, you're not safe if you're not well positioned. And well positioned could be very beautiful, um, cozied up to a masculine power, like whatever it is. Like I've done a lot of work purging this from my system and in the work saw how the tentacles of my upbringing in like swimming in the waters of patriarchy, I was just like taught that I needed to do certain things, behave certain ways, look certain ways to be safe. And so, um, I, I just want to name it because uh, I think women doing the work of purging and detoxifying that aspect, that game A competitiveness, as you see it with, I mean, back to Amber Heard, it's like, we want to throw stones at her, you know, it's sometimes, and women, young women will say this to me sometimes, it's like, you know, it's other women who are the harshest um, to me, and like that, that to me is just a symptom of the dysfunctional, um, what did you use a great word just then to cut about game A? Um, but we're detoxifying, you know, mm. like a little compassion for ourselves, but there is work to be done, um, around, yeah, coming back into a healing place, uh, in holding community and holding those values mm. real, like for real. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you find that? Definitely. I think, uh, What's lit up for me in what you've said is like that the act of detoxification implies a vision of health. And I think, I think something that is needed, I mean, I think game B is a version of a vision for a future, but it, it's a very masculine vision for a vision of a future. Something I do think is needed is a fleshed out conversation that's embodied um, and 
plural that involves like, well, if this isn't healthy, what is healthy? Mm. And what I found is that there's a need for people to self self author that vision. Like there's the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Sometimes I call it to me, it's the ancient future. Mm -hmm. Um, Game B is another framework. I like surfing amongst a lot of different kind of narratives about it, but most people don't. Mm. And so I find, and, and what's interesting is I think we get stuck in game A dynamics about what is that vision for health. Mm. And I've watched that happen. Like just choose one. It's good enough. Like aim, keep going. And, but so I think there's a need for a space that supports women to do women's work and men to figure Mm. out their conversation and for like a, like a larger process of where are we going and that would feel good. Like that Mm. actually has a feeling tone in people's bodies. I feel like there's a real need for that. Mm. That was what lit up for me because I I realized that sometimes I'm not sure we're purging because I'm not sure Mm. that there's an end game. Like I, I think we're getting crazier as, as collective sense breaks down, as collective systems break down, as we go through these waves of a sense of betrayal on behalf of our governments and our systems, like my concern mm. is that I, I suppose I could say I've had to really examine my own belief structures that we're going somewhere mm. and actually sit with what if we're not going anywhere? What if we're just getting crazier? in the context of systems collapse. But that's going somewhere, isn't it? Getting crazier? It's just interesting because the idea of detoxing implies that we're detoxing towards a more true embodiment of who we can be, which is very dear to my own belief structure. I would say for me it's already there. You know, I think I'm thinking you probably it's like mm-hmm. it's already there. It is actually what we are. And we're having to peel the layers of the onion you know we're like having to strip away um what stands between us and being ecstatic blissful beings in this incredible cosmic dance (laughs) um yeah i mean that's like part of my problem with the flow conversation is that it's often placed outside it's like it's a place that we're trying to get to maybe this is part of what you're saying is that there's this place that we're trying to get to i'm like no we are flow like we are flow when we're not what's happening there in that space like sink in that's what i'm feeling when you're speaking about like pick one and aim it's like there's so much to be done right here right in this place in this moment in this body it's like yeah the energetics of it are forward moving is this resonating yeah it is, and I I have questions about it. Okay. Like, I I think it's it's a helpful foil to hold the foil of maybe we're actually just in a collapse of our species and there isn't a there there to our idea, like to the idea that we are revealing some more, getting to a, an evolutionary next state. I suppose I'm just bringing that in because I think it's important to hold that too, mm-hmm. that in the systems dynamics at play, like on the one level we're we're trying to engineer a way to get us to the next stage of civilization. And from an internal perspective, one way to say that is we're working to reveal a deeper truth about our radiance, our flow of nature. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's simultaneously important to hold that we might not make it through that gateway and to get curious about how, for example, the detox process could just continue to spiral into deeper pathologies. Oh, I think that's and, certainly happening. I would, I mean, I agree. I agree. It's like, for me, it's like, um, yeah, no, I hear you. I think what you're saying is I just want to hold also the possibility that there's not somewhere to get to. Mm-hmm. Is that I right? I hear that. Okay. I very much hear that. Yeah. And I like, I like feeling that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm with you. Mm-hmm. What you're talking about with the kind of the masculine, the feminine principle reminds me a lot of David Dada's perspective on the masculine being the witnessing principle and the feminine principle being the witnessed, uh, being more the, mm-hmm. the dance. It's the, just the classic Shiva Shakti. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
yeah, do you do you agree with that kind of distinction? I don't think it's complete. Like that's the classic David Diada is the Shiva Shakti description, mm -hmm. but it doesn't include the yin yang. Right. So you have to build the whole map if you want to get the whole map, because in a way, um, for example, if 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 the David Diada map of presence and embodiment mm. is the only part of the map, you actually miss what you could say what the yin, the yang, what the structural actually craves, mm. which are spaces that actually mm. are much better mirrored by a cultural embodiment kind of practice where it's not about pure presence. It's about listening and feeling and perhaps it involves movement and perhaps it involves silence and perhaps it involves mirroring that's mutual. Mm. Um, and that's actually a better map for the textures of consciousness and the textures of integration that emerge in that kind of a space. So, yeah, I, I just think it's an incomplete map. Mm. I think it's useful. I think it's a useful map, particularly for men who are trying. It's to like understand. a gateway drug. I feel mm -hmm. like going on. David Dana is a little bit of gateway <laughs> drug. It was the first I remember being in like 1990 in a bookstore in Key West, Florida, and I was just like really just beginning a, my path, um, and. Uh, except that life is the path. But at that point, I began to study. And I walked into the spiritual bookstore, and I just said, I'm going to pick whatever book speaks to me. And I chose In Intimate Communion by mm -hmm. David Data. Mm -hmm. Of all the books, I had no idea. And that book rocked my world. And, I mean, I still have my copy, and it's underlined, like, so much you can barely... It's more underlined than not. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it was really helpful to me to find... Because... The Shakti, the active feminine, is so important. And I, I think um, there's a reclaiming of that that a woman goes through in her journey. Maybe not younger women. I think already the culture has moved so much. But for me, there definitely was this idea that uh, women are support. I grew up in the South. Um, which also has another cultural layer, but it was like, they take care of the home. They, you know, it's like more, um, in the background, et cetera. And, uh, and if they were strong, they were strong in a masculine way. Um, maybe you were like kicking ass at work or you had like this incredible career, you were a doctor or something like that. And so when I understood that there was this active feminine, this Eros, this Shakti, this like, wild woman archetype mm. it explained so much <laughs> really explained what had been suppressed mm. in me and, and the reclaiming of that was such a beautiful journey and and the the data work helped me with that mm -hmm. yeah i think yeah. the shadow of that frame that i see is really rife in our culture in general is that the shadow is dissociation mm. so you can cultivate wait can i take that in for a second, I love what you're saying. So the shadow of the data stuff is dissociation. Yeah, and of and of mass of quiescent masculine spiritual frameworks generally. Mm -hmm. The shadow. Oh yes. The She's shadow is. Yes. I will transcend. I will pull myself yes. into stillness. I will pull myself into non-reactivity and dispassion, mm -hmm. and like, and then we we get like very detailed, deeply practiced people who have no capacity for healthy attachment mm. or for an aesthetic, um, aesthetically rich conversation about beauty. Mm. You know, and there's a very strong argument that we can't actually create ethical frameworks to collaborate with the active masculine without a profound sense of beauty. Mm. And that that is the, the call and response that could support on the, on the active quadrant where there's this call and response of, yes, is it effective and is it beautiful? And if those two things meet, that there's juice there. And where with the quiescent masculine, you know, the shadow is, I'll meditate myself out of this grief. I'll meditate myself um, into being unbothered by my deepest feelings about these existential issues, which then doesn't give us a capacity uh, in the, the quiescent feminine is where archetypes evolve. Mm. You could think of that as it's like in the Japanese psyche, uh, uh, an example that's actually a really interesting one is 
the process by which the Japanese people integrated Hiroshima was this very, and Japanese culture is this profoundly absorptive. Buto. Mm -hmm. Dance. Buto dance. And like, like how the next wave of what became Japan was founded on this like very absorptive process of total annihilation mm. that could only happen over time and quietude and like rich felt aesthetic processes. And um, I see that, you know, as a healer, I see that in people's processes with the death of parents or people's processes with major shifts in family constellations or, um, in work or in, in, it's like, there's an absorptiveness to it that when it's, when someone names that and says that's valuable, mm. it gives permission to like a chrysalis in, in that person's consciousness or in a group's consciousness or in a culture's con consciousness that can't actually, um, have its intelligence without a little bit of naming and, and holding. And then with that, that can eventually emerge. I mean, I'm thinking of planting a seed, like the underground <laughs> stage. I mean, that's what that just felt like to me. Yeah, and I think we're in a time of new gods, like that we can't birth if we don't, if we're only in the masculine structural space. Mm -hmm. It's like that is the galaxy brain is a god on mm -hmm. some level, but it's only one kind of god. Well, it's kind of like a theological. Um, I was. Are you familiar with Richard Tarnas? Richard Tarnas's yeah. work. Astrologer. Yeah, he he wrote a book called Passion of the Western Mind, mm -hmm. which talked about the shift, basically the idea that we're in a theological shift. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that that's very true, mm -hmm. that we are actually in. Mm -hmm. There is a, um, yeah, there, there, there is a kind of a, a, a very profound shift going on towards, his his basic framing was that the masculine, discerning, analytical, rationalist, intellect had created a prison for itself yeah. ultimately kind of created a prison for itself that you see reflected in the world and that the way out was a return to the intuitive a return to more more of the feminine principle mm -hmm. and i remember reading that 20 or 30 years ago and being hugely struck yeah. by it and ever since it sort of just seems more and more true even though i think we do need a return of we need both we do need a return of kind of the the, the masculine principle as well yeah. I guess something was coming up when you were talking before about um, the kind of the hidden feminine. Because we've talked about the positives, and I'd love to com come back to that, what the feminine has to add to this conversation. But there's also the flip side as well. If you look at, we've talked about social media, like one of the perspectives on social media is that it has m multiplied um, what have traditionally been more sort of feminine um violent strategies or emotional violent strategies so reputation destruction emotional violence uh jonathan heights looked at it particularly the effect on young young women has been in incredibly marked and so one of the perspectives that that has been put forward is that we're going through particularly with with, with social media and the growth of these technologies a kind of um what's the what's the word it's like a multiplication or a or a intensification of these particular strategies which are sometimes identified with the feminine do you think that's fair or is that sexist <laughs> what do you think it feels like we're already working with symptoms and trying to solve it at the level of symptoms and uh i would not agree that male strategies are more physical typically if you work if you're looking on the energetic level so for example uh penetration energetically <laughs> there can be a violence in the way that i am addressed or ignored or used um by a man that doesn't look like swinging arms or or hitting um and one of the reasons like i, I start to get a little like one of the reasons the feminine goes covert is because she had to to survive. Like I've had this conversation with male friends who complain about women keeping secrets. And I'm like, well, there were times when women had to keep secrets as a matter of survival. Um, and 
so yeah, for me, it's still, it's like at the level of symptoms. And so it's not even that helpful. I mean, I totally agree that social media is a mess and very bad for girls. I have a 12 year old daughter and, um, we have laid such a, I have done so much work to lay a strong foundation for her of emotional intelligence. Um, she knows who she is and she is not on social media yet. And I'm going to delay that as long as possible. And a funny thing, the funny thing is she's not even interested. She sees right through most of it already. And I think that, um, that, yeah, when we're raising our children to, um, when we're nurturing their sense of self and their identity, um, teaching them to be emotionally intelligent and empathic and self-responsible, it looks like the farce that it is. It looks like the hall of mirrors. It looks like the mess that it is. I mean, she's, she's so discerning. Um, I will try to show her things in the media and she'll just immediately say, mom, this is inappropriate or mom, this is like, what, why do you, why are they talking like that to each other? It's just cruel. I'm not interested. Like, just like that. So, um, yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to say is that I think there are reasons. I wouldn't say that the masculine is physical and the feminine is covert always. Um, and I would say that that's a symptom of the distortion that we've been living in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it, it does, the dynamics of social media do particularly tend to co opt the female mind because it's about a certain kind of signifying that dovetails with shadow feminine dynamics. Um, but I tend to agree that it's more of a symptom than a cause. It's interesting how mm. the, I mean, the medium is the message in a sense, but yeah, and it's not to say that women are doing it more than men. I think it yeah. calls out those behaviours from, from, from both. Uh-huh. And actually, ironically, I think um, a lot of the yeah, a lot of the worst. I mean, the Jungian idea of the kind of anima animus. When a man is anima possessed, uh-huh. he becomes bitchy, reactive, mm-hmm. and so much of the behavior, so much of the worst behaviour I see on on social media, I would say, is kind of anima possessed men. Yeah. Because they're they're still quite aggressive because they've got kind of that testosterone edge, but they're kind of in a real sort of bitchy, reactive kind of energy. So I, I'm not saying that it's kind of divided by sex in that way. I'm, I'm pretty sure if you looked at the stats, it wouldn't be. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I find the I find that kind of the Jungian frame really useful because then you can understand when a woman is possessed by her animus, and I think this culture forces women into the animus so often to compete in a kind of mm-hmm. men's world, in the corporate world, the sort of ball buster, ball breaker, mm-hmm. castrating woman is is what we're sort of pushing women into. Mm-hmm. When a man is in his anima, kind of moody, reactive, bitchy, right. like that's so many right. of, yeah, I find it a really helpful frame. I think also you're probably asking two people who don't tweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a little bit of a... That's true. An, an the mature feminine doesn't there. go on Twitter. <laughs> it's, it's part of my brand, to be yeah. blunt. I mean, quite literally. Like, I think it's a really toxic way to communicate in general yeah. because it incentivizes those kinds of responses. Mm. Why engage? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I really don't have a deep love for social media <laughs> or, or, or even really know what to do with it, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, the the... the the light side on at least on Facebook is that there's, there is a culture of storytelling that when it's grounded really authentically has a, an ex- extraordinary richness to it. Mm-hmm. And that's something I've been really examining. I've been in a deep examination of my relationship with specifically long form social media. And I, do, I think there's there's something there that I, I want to see continue to evolve about the value of our stories when shared in an arena that mm-hmm. is Beautiful. is greater than just mm-hmm. what we can do at a table. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then where that gets, of course, instantly toxic is if we're sharing stories in order to man manipulate attention, mm -hmm. manipulate or manipulate someone else's experience. Mm -hmm. And again, that's kind of a felt sense often, like that sort of cringe. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the kind of cultural embodiment piece that we see when someone, and it's a very subtle thing because we've kind of, we've created an environment where even a kind of honest sharing, we're, we're self-aware enough to know, even if it is a genuine honest sharing coming from a kind of vulnerable place, we're, we're self-aware enough to be like, well, this is, this is a good piece of my personal brand if I share this in this particular way. <laughs> Like it's kind of unavoidable in a way, but you can also feel like the difference on a very subtle level between. I, and I find I find that just so tragic in a way where mm. people have become kind of influencers, and then every single piece of their lives suddenly has an agenda behind it of, oh, is this going to go viral? Is this going to be part of my kind of like brand? And there's so much of it in the in the kind of healer new age oh, yeah. kind of space and the younger is... people are the more likely it is that that's a distinct sub self mm. yeah it's it's kind of shocking to me the younger people are the more they're, they're they have a sub a sub universe that's the universe of mm. the authentic self that gets shared in public mm. do you think they have a healthier relationship to it or a un more unhealthy relationship I get, I, I, I'm in the question, is it possible to have a healthy relationship to, with that? Mm. I don't know. I think we're in a very large collective experiment about that. This, this, is, this is actually the exact topic of a course that I'm working on at the moment with Peter Lindbergh about the second self. Uh, uh, how can you have a mindful relationship to that second self that you put out there uh, in a way that is oriented towards growth yes. and that you're aware of all the different dynamics like capture yeah. audience capture internalized capitalism where you're kind of like thinking about the metrics all the time is there a way of having a mindful relationship to that entity that doesn't feel like it's driving you or or getting away from you or, or yeah the, we don't know we're, we're not sure we'll we'll, we'll we'll find out the um i love that course i want to take that <laughs> That's the right reaction. Yeah. No, it seems really, really useful. I mean, it brings up for me the concept of alchemical art or mm. life art. Like mm. Jonathan Harris, who was on the Stoa recently, who's a friend, he is doing such beautiful personal narrative healing work. Um, like, I think there's a very legitimate uh, role for the making of art and storytelling in this time of transition, as we are growing and changing, like the sharing from that place, and I, I really put up Jonathan as an example, a beautiful example of this, his mm -hmm. recent project in Fragments is um, exemplar. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's inspiring. Um, I, ironically or not, he got very little response mm -hmm. from this project. So he had a big career and a big profile as a digital artist uh, in the early 2000s. Spiritual journey, kind of retreated, went on this like inner, did a lot of inner work, and this is his first coming out with his art, um, this project in Fragments. And some part of him thought it would be like really received because he took six years to make it. He put everything he had into it. And then um, crickets on social media. He's like, I'm, not only am I getting fewer likes than I've ever gotten, but people are unsubscribing <laughs> at a rapid rate. And then he had to like really work through what that meant for him and the value of the work that he had made. Um, so, yeah, I think this, like how we use the medium, basically. Mm. And how much time. of ourselves we show and in what way. Yeah. Which is a big... Um, yeah, it's a big discussion that I'm kind of in at the moment. Personally, yeah. Yeah, because I feel like certainly with Rebel Wisdom, it's been there's been a sort of journalistic persona that um, I think is a benefit, and also it sort of I feel like I want to kind of move beyond in some way as well. So we're going to take a open up the the conversation here because obviously looking at the we we started this conversation talking about the gender balance on Rebel Wisdom and as the person who's basically deciding who to interview. I'm obviously in always in reflection of like, well, 
why am I making these decisions? Is there is there something about my personality or the way that I look at the world that's leading me to value these perspectives over these perspectives? And there's definitely something something in that. And and also there's um, another dynamic. When I was working at Channel Four News um, fifteen years ago or so, um, they went through a process of wanting to get a 50-50 gender balance in terms of the people they were interviewing. And so looking at like who are the who are the male academics that we're inviting on, can we find any alternatives and putting a lot of pressure on to do that. And what was very interesting, we had the playwright Lucy Preble, who's now kind of one of the showrunners for Succession, came in and said it's and she had a very nuanced view on it. She said whenever she was called up to to come on TV to talk about something, she'd always say, oh, well, I think there's someone better qualified than me. And she'd point them in the direction of a, of a, of a, of someone else. And that was often what we found when we were mm. phoning up kind of female academics is when you phone up a male academic, they'd be like, yep, what time do you need me there? <laughs> and often when you speak to a female academic, they'd, they'd say, well, I'm, I'm not really the expert in this. And you probably need to speak to this person or that person. And so there's kind of there's maybe in, internalized dynamic. dynamics as well that are much more deeper than than just who's being invited or, or yeah, yeah there, there seem to be like cultural roles social roles and probably innate ev- evolved dynamics that are coming into into play in this as well it, there's massive statistics about all of that of women being more deferential women mm. having a much harder time asking for promotions or being assertive mm. about their worth in the marketplace I've definitely experienced those dynamics mm. massively. So I think I think whether you know it or not, those dynamics certainly have played out in the rebel wisdom community. Mm. I would say additionally, I wouldn't just say, I would say there's the galaxy brain phenomena, which is we are talking about systems. Mm. But I think there's a, a piece that is not just a masculine bias, but it's a bias around the what we are talking about. Mm. And there might be an expansion of the definition of the, this, the what that mm. matters. Like if we're talking about intimacy, mm. we would want to interview Brene Brown, Esther Perel. Mm. Like I can think of many other people. If we're talking about I story, both of those, by the way. <laughs> and perhaps your brand hasn't really spoken to them about what they want to be talking about. Mm. So, or like the kind of generalized context, which seems very in this masculine structural mm. quadrant, but to actually make a proposition that we're working on marrying like the structural with the noetic, you know, the structural with the poetic, the structural with the embodied, the mm. structural with the mm. emotional. Mm then we start to get this this conversation and you can see pretty quickly that there's a greater gravitas of often masculine speakers over here and a greater gravitas of often feminine speakers over here mm. i have recently been going down a rabbit hole of finding all the awesome female podcasters mm. and there actually are a lot of them who do very very well structured work mm. and it often emphasizes more storytelling mm-hmm more personal interact mm-hmm. per- personal interaction um there may still be very clear structural bullet points but often it's more oriented towards what can be felt um and what can be actually lived by the audience mm. and so there's a piece there too about like where is the distance on well we're specializing in structures that we can all think about together Mm. versus we're struck we're focused on processes that you can live in your own life mm. and so the, and and that speaks to to your experience of putting together conferences where you're the conference is a little bit more like how you put sense making into action in your part of the universe mm. and so there might be something there around looking at how often very powerful female leaders are much more focused on that point of traction mm. Uh, I think that there's some truth in that that would be worth exploring. I love that. It's beautiful. Um, learning so much. <laughs> um, and also, uh, it, it, it just hit me. Like, why would we want to do this? Like, why? Um, and the very short answer that 
um, I gave in a conversation this morning about the same topic, like what happens when the masculine and the feminine really show up to the same space in right relationship? And the answer was fun. Like it could be so fun. There's so much fun to be had. Like there's a playfulness actually that's missing when the feminine is missing. And in some of these, like, you know, these, like, I'm going to tear it all apart. I'm going to look like it, it's, there's a, like, the, it feels, I mean, I can feel how it feels satisfying in a sense, but there's a playfulness that's available and a fun that's available when we're all dancing together that an aliveness, vitality and aliveness. Like, these are the, the pieces that, for me, that would be the why, like, let's just have more fun. Do you think you find that? Like, I forget sometimes. I'm, I'm so busy trying to solve the problem, fix it, and, like, get the women and the men, the, you know. It's like, oh, yeah, wait, why are we doing this? Because it's going to be amazing when we actually figure it out. <laughs> so this conversation has been all about what's missing from the conversation. Before we close, is there anything missing that we haven't said yet? The thing that I'm present to is, uh, that we spoke about earlier, is that I feel like I want to see more conversations about imminence, about the fabric of the relationships we're stewarding through these frameworks. Mm. Um, it the is, relationships between people? Or? The relationships between people, the relationships between people and ecosystems, mm -hmm. the relationships between uh, peoples and peoples, between cultures, uh, the relationships that uh, flow between um, any actors in a living system. Like my sense of, uh, of, the next stage of civilization is like, my sense is that we have mastered objectivity. I understand this thing out there and we've mastered subjectivity to a certain degree. Like, and, and a lot of this conversation has been about subjectivity and intersubjectivity, but the next stage of civilization is going to be about mastering intersubjectivity 100%. and interobjectivity. It's going to be about, can we manage the flows of information energy and atoms between things in a way that is masterful and harmonious. And that's a conversation essentially about imminence, about the flows of relationships and interactions and values between things. Mm -hmm. And that's a conversation I'd like to see much more prominent as, a, as opposed to we understand, which is omniscience you know, or we're heading towards transcendence. We're trying to get beyond this. I would say where we're really heading is towards integration and a certain mastery of in the worldness. Mm -hmm. And that I, I crave greater attention for that conversation and greater, in, uh, yeah, greater attention put on it, greater intelligence oriented towards it of like, look, we've, we've our, our greatest problems are problems of coordination. And all coordination is a function of interaction. Mm. And, and to me, that's the most important conversation we could possibly be having. And like the qu a question I've been asking is like, could we actually transition to this next stage of civilization without putting the sacred in the center of it? And if we do, if we put the sacred at the center of the process or the soul at the center of the process, then the whole process becomes a ceremony. Amen, sister. I'm in. I want life as a ceremony. That's what I want. <laughs> Conversation is ceremony. Life is ceremony. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Amen. <laughs> and a little woman. <laughs> Clarissa Pinkola Estes always answer pieces like that. Amen. And a little woman. <laughs>